Hi, everyone. Big lights. So yeah, I do have the, the Rock Your Java t-shirt. This Rockstar thing, by the way, is something Java 1 designates people as. So you know those votes you guys all do? That's, that's where it ends up going. Um, this, this our marketing department put together, and, and, and I'll get back to it in a second. Uh, but I, I like to put this, this picture up at the beginning of, of many of my talks. Anybody here recognize what that is? It's hard for me to see there. Somebody want to shout out? Apollo 13. Apollo 13, exactly. That is the CO2 scrubber from Apollo 13. And for those of you who might be too young to remember or to have seen the movie, um, <laughs> Apollo 13 was supposed to go to the moon, didn't quite make it. They had an accident on the way. Um, And, and they did get everybody back alive. Uh, a big problem they had was that the CO2 scrubber, um, they, they had to fit three people into the lunar lander for a long duration, much longer than it was designed for. It was designed for two people for about a, a third of the time. And, and the CO2 scrubber was not, did not have enough capacity and they were basically going to poison themselves with CO2. Uh, the command module, the big part that had the problem and had to be shut down, had a CO2 scrubber, but it was square. And they had to fit a square peg into a round hole. That's literally what that is. Um, and engineers had to figure out how to do this with the parts that were there in the spaceship. And, and, or people would die. And, and that was a truly heroic effort. Um, as you can see, they did it with, with duct tape. This is the ultimate in duct tape engineering. Um, and, and it is truly heroic, and, and you guys might recognize the pattern of sometimes every once in a while engineers get called on to save the day, hopefully not with people's life on the line. Um, and when we do, there's this elation, this, this amazing feeling. If you get to do this a few times in your career where, where everything would have broken except for you saved it, it is truly a, a great feeling. But, but. It's very important afterwards to remember that our job is to come back, look at this, and think of how, what we can do to make this never happen again. The post-mortem parts, the, the analysis, the why did I have to do a heroic act uh, for things to keep working is important. And, and in this specific case, hopefully, the post-mortem uh, looked at this, I'm hoping, I'm assuming, that Apollo 14 went up with CO2 scrubbers that were the same shape, for example. Um, but whenever you see duct tape on engineering results, you should think, uh, what should I be doing in order to remove that duct tape? Because in the long run, duct tape is, is when you put it on, it feels really good. But ripping it off, that's a different story. Now, this talk is actually my attempt at at fixing some duct tape that I see uh, around. And, and you'll see how that comes together as we go. But I find this a pretty inspirational and directional thing to do. When you see duct tape on systems, remember to come back and take it off later. So there, it does work. Um, so our title for today is How I Stop Worrying and Learn to Love Misery. And, and this connects to a subject I've been talking about for several years. Um, the, the way we're going to walk through this is simple. I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of introduction. I'm going to explain how much of monitoring out in the world is simply, simply broken and how it's so bad that there's probably no more fixing it and that there's some lights and tunnels involved at the end of this. And also that we, while there is a lot of misery out there, we can actually learn to appreciate it and maybe gain from that learning. Uh, subjects that I've given to this overall area in the past are things like understanding latency and application responsiveness. These are actual talk titles. Uh, microservices and response time behavior or, or a little more whimsical how not to measure latency. But the actual title for the subject that I usually put somewhere in the slides is this. And that's because in most rooms, I can actually see your faces. I can't hear. The lights are too strong. <laughs> but, but 
when, when I talk through some of what I will talk through, there's an inevitable reaction in a few places in the room where people kind of have this, yeah, I think that's what we do. And, and when that happens, what I've always told audiences is feel free to exclaim, oh shit, it is okay. In this room, it's okay, regardless of what your parents told you. And, you know, it's okay. Afterwards, just go back to being polite. But here, it's okay to say, oh shit, in the right places. I might prompt you here and there. Now, I've been talking about this for a while. In fact, I did a talk here in Melbourne. Uh, about this very subject. Um, and, and that was in 2014. And, and you can't see this shirt or can't really read it, so I'll zoom into it. You see 2014 over here in Melbourne at Yao. And the subject was how not to measure latency. Now this is coming full circle and explaining why I give up. Let's just go ahead and measure it that way. And and why we can live with the outcomes, probably. So I stopped worrying and learned to love misery. This is a picture of me a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I'll get to a picture of me, but I, I'm the CTO of, and, and a co-founder of Azul Systems. I, I, I work on a lot of things. I've built a lot of stuff. And one of the things people probably know me the best for is garbage collection. At Azul, we've solve the problem of GC pauses for Java, they're gone. Um, truly gone. I know what that sounds like, but it's my algorithm and it works. I, I claim it does, yeah. Um, but here's some evidence of actual work on garbage collection. That's a real picture of me. Um, and, and this machine in my kitchen is a trash compactor. I think here in Australia, you guys are not as lazy as the Californians. Um, the job of a trash compactor in California is to compact the garbage in the trash can. It does minor garbage collection compactions during the week so that you only have to do the full GC only once a week where you carry the thing outside. And in this case, there was a problem. The compactor algorithm wasn't working right. You can see that there are fragments that were pouring out the back and I had to manually defragment the heat. Um, and, and I thought at the time that it would be funny to take a picture with the actual GC theory book, and, and that was 15 years ago. Um, I, I've done a lot of other things. I've built all kinds of machines, physical and virtual and operating systems, and accidentally built an application server in the late 90s. Um, and I also like to go around depressing people, like you, about subjects like this. So we'll get into the little bit of level setting and introduction, talk about the world we sort of live in or want to live in. We, we talk about services and microservices a lot, and, and we come from a, a world where, where applications were siloed and, and were kind of stovepiped. Um, so this evolution from a stovepipe environment to a services and later microservices uh, uh, environment often looks like this. We have different systems, and each of the systems was over time broken into services. And, and, and those services talk to each other within the system, but now we have services, we expose them to other parts of this other systems. We start seeing these interconnections between them. And if you look closely, you can still see the original boundaries for a while, right? Uh, but over time, you're hoping it grows into an actual network of services and microservices. And that's a really nice picture, right? Um, and if you're really successful, it'll keep growing that way into something like that. <laughs> that is Amazon 10 years ago, according to some Amazon people. These are, this is a map of their microservices, and it's grown quite a bit since. And the thing to keep in mind when you break a system into smaller and smaller services is this is an architecture decision, but we're building an architecture made of a lot of pieces. This is one piece. This is a microservice. This is a microservices architecture. <laughs> and that's a very important analogy to keep in mind because the sensitivity of the system as a whole to any one piece has increased dramatically. When we had those soft pipes and, and separated systems, the worst they could do was break themselves. Right? Um, now, because of this, because of the interdependencies of services and now microservices, we've evolved all kinds of systemic 
uh, tools to allow us to work this and keep things resilient, keep things redundant or survivable. And one of the big ones we've learned to use is circuit breakers or their equivalents. The job of a circuit breaker is not to randomly flip and annoy people, it's to prevent fires. A circuit breaker in a physical world will flip before the wire in the wall catches fire. It flips at a lower rating than the one we actually catastrophically fail in. And, and the analogy is apt. When we look at services and we protect them by, with various either, either circuit breakers or, or a pushback mechanisms or back pressure mechanisms, invariably we watch them for their behavior. And when they start behaving not great, but well before they melt down, we, we start pushing back. We prevent the meltdown, either by a total flip and say, it's gone, you, you have to do without it for a while, or, or some other rate limiting. One of the early libraries and microservices that did this very well is Hystrix from Netflix. It integrates into pretty much any service used as a library to communicate between services. And since everything communicates through the library, you have a common mechanism for both monitoring and breaking circuits. Uh, this has evolved, and we now have all kinds of service mesh environments. Um, these are just a few that I've picked, and I don't like to pick favorites, but they've been eating each other. Um, so I'm not sure what the future will be, but, but various forms of taking the services, putting them together, and making sure that in that together, there's a systemic way to monitor them, protect them, deal with the, with the lines between them that are not service by service custom. The service could be very independent in its decisions, uh, but the way we run the whole mesh is not intentionally. So we may have a metric system that collects the, from the individual services and connections in various ways. We'll put them together into dashboards but since there's so many of them, we can't do the dashboards anymore. We start looking at visualization systems like this or like that to try and show the flows. And, and fundamentally, we're putting together a way, we have put together as an industry, a way to look at all these. Um, we often look at a separation of a data plane where the actual services talk to each other in various ways and a control plane that gets us the telemetry and the control onto common systems from there. So we're building this. And my job, remember, is to depress you, right? This is me. <laughs> so before we go any further, I do need to give you a choice. Um, we're going to talk about some unfortunate realities. And, and if you don't want to hear them, we can, you can take the blue pill. The door is right there. You can leave. You can keep believing whatever it is you want to believe. But if we do stay, we're going to take the red pill and we will see a little bit of how far the rabbit hole goes. That's a bad misquote of the movie. But remember, all I'm offering is the truth. Yeah. OK. So let's start. Um, we like to look at pretty charts. Here's a pretty chart. Uh, this is a chart of a service, uh, looking at it over a period of two hours with a few colored lines. Uh, the top line there is the 95th percentile, then we have the 90th, the 75th, the median, and the 25th percentile. That's a full two hours of looking at the service from data points and metrics that we got for that one service across a wide spectrum of time. A anything catch your eye here that we should look at? A spike, a spike, there's a spike, you're right. And we should probably go look at that spike because, you know, it went up and, and then that 90th percentile also went up. The rest of them seem to have not been affected. It's something affected the top 5 to 10 percent. We might want to look at what happened there. And this is a simple demonstration of a completely useless exercise because there's nothing on this chart that's any use. Nothing at all. This is a completely useless chart. I just wasted 20 seconds of your life. Um, what's the problem here? Well, there are a few, but let's start with this one. That's the 95th percentile. What's not on this chart? What has been erased from this chart so that you don't have to worry about it? The bad 5%. We don't want to hear about bad things, right? This is the 95% things that were good. The worst 5% have been thrown out before we plotted a single dot on the line. 
Uh, this is a chart of the good things. This is the chart of, don't worry, everything's okay even though it's not. Before that spike happened, 5% of things had to be terrible, worse than that spike, for you to even get to this point. And nobody told you anything before or after. Now, this is a great chart for marketing. It's a great chart for getting your bonus even though you didn't do your job. And those life skills are also important. But, <laughs> but in monitoring systems, we kind of want to see the bad things. The job is to tell us where the bad things are, not tell us everything's okay even though it's not. So we don't want monitoring systems that are in the business of doing that, right? But we do have them. So I, I, I actually showed a very similar chart here five years ago, and somebody from the audience came out to me afterwards and said I was texting with our guys, and I said, hey, what's our 95th percentile? And they got this exact chart from New Relic with 95th percentile right there. So I asked them, what else do we know? And they did have the 99th percentile, so they sent it to them. That yellow line is that yellow line. And in case you're wondering, is there something hiding above it? Yeah, by definition, it's sorted data. Everything that you didn't show is worse. It's not some random thing. And it's much worse. I mean, it's much worse. But this is a much better chart, right? This shows the 99th percentile. There's another 1% that nobody kept, because why would you keep that many numbers? Uh, that's much worse than the blue line. So I go around ranting about this. One of the formats I use is something I call latency tip of the day. I'm not as good as I should be about writing them, but the format is simple. I tweet something like this, and then I rant about my own tweet in a blog like this, okay? Um, it's very satisfying, because um, nobody will engage with me otherwise. So. <laughs> Um, so, so this chart comes out of one of those rants, and, and as you see, it's not just one thing that's wrong with it. I told you about one. Let's look at another cool thing that's interesting about this chart. So this chart has lines. The problem with lines is it's hard to talk about them. When somebody says, calls you and says, uh, so what's the 95th percentile behave like? You, you don't say, well, it's like this. You know. <laughs> You're looking for summaries, you're looking for numbers, and there are numbers, there's a number here. In fact, that's the only number on this chart that's associated with the 95th percentile. The average of the 95th percentile in these two hours is 184 milliseconds, that is a number. It's the most likely number you're going to quote if you're asked about it, because it's right there in front of you. What does it mean to average the 95th percentile over two hours? I mean, seriously, what does this mean? So let's do a little math or a demonstration of how silly the math would be. It is hard to deduce things from averages of percentiles, but we can use a very intuitive percentile, the hundredth percentile, the maximum, which acts like all other percentiles from a point of view of math. And we can take an example data set. Here are 15 data points. Imagine that was the maximum for every one minute that we watched. And when we average it, guess what number we're gonna get? Well, I picked the number. <laughs> um, so the average of the maximum for 15 minutes is 42. Great. What does that mean? Anybody see the number 42 in the data set or anything close to it? Is the maximum anywhere close to 42? I mean, the maximum is clearly 601 there. The average <clears throat> of a percentile is just complete nonsense. There is no meaning at all to it. The only thing we actually know about it is it's gonna be larger than the smallest value and smallest than the largest value. But that's it. It's, it's just a number. It's a random number. But we have it on screen so we communicate it. And maybe we'll even watch it, right? Maybe we'll even flip a circuit breaker on it accidentally. So if you want a tip, you cannot average percentiles. There is no math that does that. There is no remedy for this. Averages of percentiles simply don't work but we use them all the time. So percentiles probably matter though. What percentiles do you guys watch? Let's, some shout outs of what percentile in a monitoring system somebody's watching. Anybody here watching the 94th percentile? Yeah. 99th percentile? I see a few there. 99.9th uh, percentile? 
Nope. Okay. Um, do you guys know what flips your circuit breakers? It's typically, in most of these systems, seems to be the 99 or 99.9. But, but let's look a little bit at, at what those indicate. So 99th percentile is a common area people look at. And, and we tend to think that that's pretty good coverage. I mean, 99th percent of, 99 percent of the spectrum. And we don't really need perfection. We're building systems that can handle resilient uh, failures and such. Uh, but let's look at what it means to have the 99th percentile. What are the chances that an external interaction, a service calling you, uh, an API call, a human clicking on a web page, uh, will experience worse than the 99th percentile of one of these things, uh, a search engine node, a key value store, a database node or service, a CDN, or your microservice being watched with 99th percentile. What are the chances that something external will see that? And remember, you are part of a compound system. So I went to a few web pages a while back, and, and I actually counted from my web browser after caching on a single click reload, how many HTTP requests the browser actually went and got. These are the actual numbers for these websites. And you can see they're in the hundreds or in the mid tens for the best, cleanest uh, site there. The Google search page with no junk on it still has 31 resources there. And each one of those is a separate request, a separate HTTP request and response. These are the chances of seeing worse than the 99th percentile of an HTTP request in any one of those pages. In a single click, my chance of seeing worse than the 99th percentile is right there. It's high. It's more than half for almost everything. The only one that's less than half is that Google search page where there's still a 26.5% chance that with one click I'll hit worse than the 99th percentile. So the 99th percentile of what you do, that little service you're watching, is amplified when people actually see it. Now, most of your loads are going to experience worse than this. If we look at this from an overall user experience perspective, imagine a very short session of only five clicks. Imagine that each one of them is super clean and only 40 resources. How many of the people interacting with whatever the service is will not see something worse than the 95th percentile in their session. That's what the math works out to be. 99.997% of the clicks on the, the sessions on this site will experience worse than the 95th percentile of an HTTP request. So why are we looking at this number? It is relevant to nobody. It tells you it's a number that everything will be worse than. Well, there are a few that aren't. If you looked at the 99th percentile, it'll be a little better. Uh, sorry, the three nines, you'll cover 82% of the population with it. At least it's more than half. At least it's a majority, but you still have 18% uncovered. You could look at it backwards and ask yourself, what percentile do I need to watch of a service in order to, exp to, to gauge or predict the percentile of the experience of an API call or a user clicking. Um, and, and if you want to know about the 95th percentile user, you need to watch roughly that with those numbers. If you want the 99th percentile user, you need four and a half nines. So you need to watch a lot of nines. If you want to look at percentiles, you need to look deep into the nines when you look at individual little things. Because one and two nines are just what everything is worse than. The median is also kind of a useless number for knowing how bad things are. It tells you how good things are. So we, we do a lot of this, let's look at numbers and put them together. And a lot of this has to do with wishful thinking. We, we, learned, we learned some math in school. And we really, really want the data we have to fit into that pretty chart of bell curves that will just be right and work for us. Um, and in order to do that, we, we collect a bunch of numbers, a few data points, summarize them with percentile standard deviations averages, and that gives us a feel for the shape of the data. You know, one number, no, but two, maybe three, maybe four will give me a feel. Another way people often look at this is if I cover 99% of the spectrum, how bad can the rest really be? The answer is actually worse than everything you've seen because you've sorted the data and only looked at 
the, the bottom 99. But, but it's intuitive to think, uh, it's pretty good. I, I have a good feel here. So let's take a look at a common technique for doing this. I have run into this quite a bit. We know from school that when we have a normal distribution of numbers, a good spread of them, we can get the mean and then get a standard deviation. And that will let us project sort of the, the curve. And, and we could do math, for example, if the mean was this and the standard deviation was that, um, then if you look up there within three, three standard deviations is where the 99.7% is. If we want an estimate of the 99th percentile, 99.9, .9, we could just do this math. And people will often go through this. Mostly, if you ever show somebody a standard deviation number, they assume that this math is appropriate because otherwise, why would you show them the number? You're, you're basically telling them you think the distribution can be, this number could be useful for that. And unfortunately for responsiveness, latency, um, all those kind of time from A to B things, this is always, always wrong. Always. I've been looking for years and years for a data set where standard deviations will be actually mapped to real numbers and I've not found one yet. <clears throat> Let's look at a real data set. Here's a system. This is a system that people had actually worked on for years. And they've done a great job. You see how they've flattened the response time across a wide spectrum. Um, all the way, way past the 99 percentile, we have a great, great flat uh, response time. But what do you think would happen if I scroll a little to the right and start looking at the interesting percentiles? Well, when I do that, there's a little bump there. I'm not kidding, that's the little bump because if I scroll to the right, there's another bump. <laughs> and the factor, the ratio between the high point here and the low, the, the, sorry, not the low point, the 99 percentile point is 1,000 to 1. And this is not uncommon, this is the norm. This is a, a low latency system, this is between 50 or 70 microseconds and 50 milliseconds, but it's the same when you go between half a millisecond and 500 milliseconds or five seconds occasionally uh, when you have a spike. Now, there are a few interesting things I've learned from looking a lot of these, at, at a lot of these data sets. One of them is what I call percentile archaeology. Um, when you look at a mature system and you plot it like this, and I've built tools to plot it like this, you find a really interesting behavior. The chart has these these bumps, these are modes, a good mode, a bad mode, and a terrible mode. And the bumps, the lines, bend at whole numbers of nines. This is not an accident, this is a real system. I didn't make this data up. Why do percentile charts bend at whole numbers of nines? What's the natural law here? Well, it's really simple. People look at numbers of nines. And if this is a mature system that's been out there for a couple of years, people have shaped it to be this because somebody told them that they care about the 99.9% .9 also, they made it good. Then somebody afterwards said, hey, the four nines is important too, so they made that good. And basically we keep sweeping things under that proverbial carpet to the right. If we look at the actual numbers here, those stats I gave you from before, that's from this data set. That is the mean and that's the standard deviation. And you know what? That 99.9% .9 is actually pretty, pretty well predicted by the standard deviation. However, we have this data point here. The five nines of this data set is that number. That number is 184 standard deviations away from the mean. Now, if you go back to basic statistics, in a normal distribution, the five nines are supposed to fall within four and a half sigma. Let's be generous, it's not really normal, seven, eight sigma, but 184 sigma, the big bang would happen 17 times before that point can happen in that data set in a normal distribution. Now there's nothing wrong with the data or the math. This is simply not a normal distribution. And neither is any response time chart that you will ever look at, except for the ones you make up. If you see one that does have a normal distribution, it's probably not real. So here's my definition of averages. Standard deviation falls into the same category. They're very useful if what you want to do is ignore reality. Okay, so 
you know, why is it that we don't have all these nines, right? Yeah, it's my fault, I know. Um, well, there are a few key things here. The first one is we can't average percentiles. Hopefully you got that message. Another one is when we have lots and lots of data, we have to summarize it, and we tend to summarize it in short intervals. And those short intervals don't have enough data to produce a high number of nines. So we have a lot of intervals in a two-hour period. We, we have a lot of percentiles, but because we can't average them, there's no way to reconstruct the high number of nines. So we don't. So we talk about small numbers of nines because that's the data we have. If you really want to address this, I built a, I call it a, a yak shaving co-op on GitHub. It's HDR histogram. I built the Java version. There are seven other language ports of this thing now. And it'll give you a way to deal with data and percentiles and histograms and add them and get the precise things and chart this. Great. Um, you can do this. And, and it does help. And I've been trying to convince the world to use it. But as I said, I've kind of given up for a few reasons. One of them is this problem. I call this the coordinate admission problem. And the coordinate admission problem is something that started me down this field, even been talking about the subject. And I call it an accidental conspiracy because I see it everywhere. Nobody means to do it. But at first I noticed and I said, that's weird. I wonder if this happens elsewhere. So I looked around and everywhere I look, there it is. It's very rare not to see it. Has anybody here noticed how I spell percentiles? Yeah. Coordinate admission is the lie in percent lies. It is why even if we do all that right, and even if you use my histogram, your data is still wrong because it's wrong at the input level. So let's talk about how that happens. The most common thing a monitoring system will do is monitor time. And, and it will do that by taking measurement before and after operations, measuring how long things take, and then put them in buckets for later processing, summarization, and display. This, this is the actual code Cassandra uses for measuring the percentiles of its read operations, for example. This is actually the code. Well, it's a code from an old version. The new version has that in about 300 lines of code that do the same thing. Um, but, but that is truly the logic. When you get that data from an MXB that tells you what the percentile reads, this is where it came from. And most of your monitoring systems are doing this. Um, and what's the problem here? I mean, this is measuring time. The, the problem is that when the system glitches, the measurements glitch. And, and as long as, as we measure all the time, everything's fine. But if we stop, we also stop measuring. And delays that are outside of the measurement things are not being measured. So one operation could be long. The next operations that have been waiting will enter the measurement period after I stop freezing, and I won't be blaming them for that. Um, load generators also do this exact same problem. I've managed to fix a few of them, WIK2, Cassandra Stress, Gatling has fixed their stuff, uh, um, Radar Gun, and there are a few others, but most load generators will still exhibit coordinate emission. Now, what what can this do to you? How bad can it get? Let's, let's run a quick hypothetical. Imagine a perfect system, truly perfect. A um, hundred things a second being requested, each one perfectly answered in one millisecond. And then we take this perfect system and intentionally freeze it for a hundred seconds. Control Z on the keyboard, count a hundred seconds and see what happens. Now, I'm going to try to describe this system to you honestly in a way that you would want your monitoring system to describe it. Uh, we can do simple math on averages, even though they're not great. On the left, the average is one millisecond by definition. On the right, the average is 50 seconds for the second 100 seconds. Why? Because at the beginning, it's 100 seconds. At the end, it's almost zero. It averages to 50 if you randomly come in that period. Overall, across 200 seconds, we should see an average of 25 seconds. The math is pretty simple. And here are the percentiles. The median is great, but then it gets really bad, and the four nines obviously are close to 100 seconds. There are no tricks here. This is, this is what you would want somebody to tell you about a system if this is how the system behaved. Okay? So what does your monitoring system tell you about this? Let's measure this system. If we measure the system with the code I showed you before, we would get 10,000 results here. 
and then we'll get this terrible, terrible result here. And that's it, that's our data. That's what's in the bucket. We will then summarize it, put it in time series databases, plot it on charts, show the 95th percentiles or whatever it is. And if we did that math, we'll find that the average is a few milliseconds and that the four nines of this system is perfect. I don't know why anybody's complaining about it. I mean, 99.99% of stuff in the system is one millisecond. What's the problem? Now, yeah, this seems outrageous, 100 seconds people would notice, but now imagine that this was half a second out of every second. And everything in your monitoring systems that show top and CPU show, hey, everything's busy and flowing. For half a second out of every second, we're doing nothing, but the other half a second is doing very well. Um, so here's the numbers, right? So what's, what's going on here? Why is this so wrong? Well, it's pretty simple. If we measure 10,000 results in a 100 second period, we should be measuring 10,000 results in any 100 second period, not just in the good ones. And if we actually spent the time to do that, we would get all this data, and if we did the math on it, we would get exactly the description we expect. Coordinate emission is the act of eliminating the bad results. Coordinated emission of data, not random emission of data, but we take the bad stuff and we erase it. And unfortunately, our systems tend to do that immediately on their own. Now, they have an even more annoying uh, 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 quality where they keep one bad result, so you think it's measuring right, right? Is the max right? Yeah, it is. It's just everything in the middle was censored. And as a result, we get that. Now, often people will tell me, okay, okay, I get it. The measurements aren't exactly right, but my job is to make things better. I don't need to know exactly what the number is. I just need to know which way it's pointing. If I'm improving the system or making it worse, so let's dispel the notion you could do that with percentiles. I actually started from this point because we spent three months of engineering trying to fix a non-existent problem. We took a system that was acting like that, we improved it, and then we got bad results. So we went to measure why and we kept optimizing and we kept getting bad results. Imagine you took this system and you fixed it. Instead of dropping 9,999 requests, you answer every one of them pretty quickly in five milliseconds. Not quite as, as good as before, but hey. You spent a month doing this, and you feel really good about it. And then you measure, so you get data. And your data shows you that you made the system five times worse at the four nines. So we should probably revert this change, go back to the much better system we had before we put all this effort in, because clearly its numbers were better. People were much happier with it, right? So that doesn't actually work. Now, when we look at coordinate emission, it, it basically has this effect of mixing up response time and service time. From queuing theory, service time and response time could be seen this way. Service time is how long it takes to provide a service. Take your order, make the coffee, give you the coffee. Response time is what people actually experience. Nobody experiences service time. Service time is a completely navel-gazing uh, measurement. You can't see it from the outside. But coordinate emission reports responses times using service time measurements. And if we actually look at the data, they're separated by orders of magnitude in real systems that are not saturated, that are not running into trouble. And if you look at the real world or the virtual world, people react to that when they see it in, in real measurements, once you give them tool to do it. And this is where my red-blue pill comparison came from. Right? Um, not mine. Okay, so, so it's pretty bad. Anybody have had a, an oh shit moment yet? Okay, I see a few hands. Yep, that's what the talk's about. And, and this, is, this is maddening. Like, you know, what are we doing? How can we even live with this? I've been trying to fix this for years and it hasn't moved the needle. You guys still do it wrong. Um, so frustration is everywhere. Um, and how does the world even work if everything is so wrong? Well, the good news is that it does work. We have empirical evidence. You guys came to a conference, which means your systems are not currently on fire. Um, or at least you don't think they are. Um, but I do think that there's a rainbow at the end of this tunnel. 
So, you know, here's a rainbow at the end of a tunnel. There's also light in there. And that rainbow is really that there is something we are doing that actually works. In addition to all this other stuff we do that probably doesn't. So, you know, there is something that we actually do, every one of you does, that works for your business and keeps it afloat and prevents it from melting down, even though all the numbers are completely wrong. So what is that something? And, and I have some theories about that. If we look at a common flow, DevOps is a common one to look at now, and focus on the monitoring part, I think of monitoring a lot like you would medicine. But our monitoring is medicine at 3000 BC. And now imagine that you were running around hunting and gathering something and, and you fell down a ravine and you hurt your knee 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. And, and now, hey, maybe you'll just die or maybe you could just ride this out. But most likely if you looked around, there'd be some sort of a local witch doctor or, or shaman or something, you know, your doctor went to witch doctor medicine and has, you know, it, it, they have a degree and they probably look like this. And you'll go there and they'll, they'll sit you down and they'll do a little dance and a chant and, and, and put some smoke around and, you know, maybe they'll sacrifice a goat. Uh, they might rub a few herbs together and give them to you or put them on something and, 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 you know, they might draw blood. We have all kinds of superstitions that live to this day about, you know, we monitoring the systems and we'll go, looks okay, yeah. And bad ca black cats around monitoring systems are bad, right? Um, but something here worked. Not everything you do works. There's a lot of tradition and most likely the witch doctor didn't even know what of the things they do is the thing that works. I think it probably was the herbs, but I don't know. Uh, and, and the reality is we do stuff out of tradition that works. We evolve until the things in some work. And we could keep doing that, but we could probably look for what actually works to do our job better and focus on that and maybe ignore the rest or try to spend less time on the rest. So we know that our job is to figure out if things are good or bad and, and not ignore the bad, right? And if we wait until they're really bad, that's too late. But what we could do is look at the grades in between. And there's, you know, it's okay, but not perfectly happy. And there's, it's not totally broken, but people are calling you on it, right? Now this is, to me, the focus that I like to look at. This is misery. When things are miserable, you know about them. You don't need percentiles to tell you that timeouts are happening. You don't need percentiles to tell you that phone calls are angry and that people are getting fired and that you're losing business. That's not percentiles. There are other things that show you that. And you can't avoid measuring the things that do that because if you did, you wouldn't be in business. When you start off, you might not know what to measure, but you very quickly learn. And, and when we look at these, any of these, these are all things that you can count, not percents, but you can actually count them. They're occurrences of bad things that happen, miserable things that happen. And with miserable things, the right question is not to ask, was my 99th percentile miserable? What do you care? Like, was the 99th percentile 100 milliseconds? That's a yes, no question, right? Well, what if it was below 100 milliseconds? Does that mean everything's fine? What if it wasn't? Does that mean we're totally screwed? Um, the right thing to say is how many bad things happen or what percent of things are bad as opposed to what is the percentile X which gives me a number. And when we do that, we can actually monitor the totality of it. This is an example of actually monitoring misery in production. Um, People do this. This is a simple chart. The green line is load. This is a seven day load on a monitoring system. You can see the weekend at the beginning and then five days of the week. That's the green line. And the, the orange line there is simply the, the success rate. Um, the top 2% of success rate, the X axis level is 98%. So you can see that success rate goes up and down with load, that 
It gets bad after a bunch of load. It recovers when the load is low. That's what it looks like. And you're measuring the actual misery. The actual bad things is when that thing dips. Now, when you do that, you can focus on it and say, I want to make it better. And as you can see, some bright engineer somewhere figured out how to make it better on the right. Anybody want to guess what they did to make it better? Not the guys who know. They deployed Zing, RJVM. <laughs> they simply rolled, on, rolled it onto a Cassandra cluster and everything got better. Um, that makes me really proud. It's also why I like to measure misery, because it's the thing we make better. Um, but that's not what this talk is about. We're talking about the misery and how to watch it. And when you look at it this way, you can actually see the effects of your work. You can actually see if you made things better or worse. You can see the things that need to get better, because business people can tell you that, no, it's not OK to fail to answer 1% of things when the load is high. That's just not OK. Now, when we measure that, we'll be looking at individual services, maybe at the aggregate of all of them as well, because you want to look at misery at that level. And remember, the, this thing will get more complex, and we will be going through the whole microarchitecture to full architecture level. So when we measure misery, we're measuring the misery of one domino. And we probably also need to look at the system as a whole. So we have those metrics for each of the things. We watch it and we can say bad, good, above levels, timeouts, etc. But we have a lot of them to watch. Um, and the aggregate of that is where monitoring systems do or should focus. In fact, the main thing is don't look at the green stuff. You only should look at the miserable stuff. That's where the work is. And, and you should funnel it towards that. So in summary, as a message to you guys, I know this might be depressing and all the numbers are wrong, but, but don't worry. Just love the misery. Watch the misery. Focus on the misery. The misery is the part that works. The percentiles are the goat. Don't spend your time on them. And if you want one last tip of the day, don't aim to make any one percentile accept acceptable. Simply make aim for, a, for an acceptable percent of misery metrics and figure out what those misery metrics are for your business and just ask, how much are we allowed to have? What should our goal be? And when you ask in those terms, you can actually monitor for it. So with that, um, I'll just leave you with that message, and we'll take a few questions if we have time. Uh, how are we on time? We have time. Good, good. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Gil.